We are honored today and we are blessed to be within the divine precincts of the great Masjid al-Kufa within the city of Kufa. The city of Kufa in itself is one of the most ancient establishments within human history. For indeed we have within our traditions that it is within this blessed city of Kufa that we have close to 370 prophets and biya from the Anbiya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who are buried within the city of Kufa and we have close to 600 successes from the successors of the Holy Prophets that are buried in the city of Kufa. In addition to the city of Kufa, you have the Grand Mosque known as Masjid al-Kufa. This Masjid al-Kufa in whose sahan in his courtyard we are at the moment, historians have very remarkably and very accurately marked out all the places of importance within this blessed mosque and the narrations that speak about the divinity of this mosque are great for indeed we have a narration from Imam Abi Ja'far Muhammad al-Baqir salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi where he says to one of his companions La tada'ya Abu Ubaidah as salat fi masjid al-Kufa wa law ataytahu habwan O oh, Abu Ubaidah, do not leave or do not abandon reciting, do not miss the chance to recite Salat in Masjid al-Kufa, even if it means you having to come crawling to Masjid al-Kufa. Yani an expression to show that no matter how difficult, no matter how tiring, no matter how difficult the journey may be to Masjid al-Kufa, be sure that you go through this difficulty to come to Masjid al-Kufa even if it entails you crawling on your feet to come here. فَإِنَّ الصَّلَاةِ فِيهِ تُعْدِلْ سَبْعِينَ الصَّلَاةِ فِي الْمَسْجِدِ فِي غَيْرِهِ مِنَ الْمَسَاجِدِ The Imam says that Salat in Masjid al-Kufa it is equivalent, the reward is equivalent to reciting 70 prayers in any other mosque. We have traditions that Masjid al-Kufa is one of the first mosques to ever be built on this earth. And the precincts or the parameters of Masjid al-Kufa that we have over here, even before this mosque was built, this, the parameter of this area was a place which the angels used to descend down from the heavens and had taken this place on earth before human population even began or existed. The Malaika and the angels used to take this place as a place of worship. And hence, we are able through these traditions to gain an insight and a glimpse into the divinity that surrounds Masjid al-Kufa. From amongst the places of great distinction and reverence within Masjid al-Kufa, we have the maqam which is known as Maqam Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. For we have within our traditions that as the Holy Prophet was traveling on Mi'raj from Masjid al-Haram to Masjid al-Aqsa, they passed over this land of Masjid al-Kufa. Jibra'il asked Rasulullah, O Prophet of God, do you know which area this is? And Rasulullah asks Jibra'il to inform him. At this place, Jibra'il tells him, or at this point, Jibra'il tells him, Ya Rasulullah, this is the parameters or the precincts of Masjid al-Kufa, the great mosque of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, where every Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has been ordained to come and recite Salat within this mosque. And it is then 
on his way from Masjid al-Haram to Masjid al-Aqsa that Rasulullah stops over here in Masjid al-Kufa. And at this particular point over here, as is remarkably recorded and preserved by the historians, Rasulullah stopped here and recited a two rakat salat on his way to Masjid al-Aqsa and from Masjid al-Aqsa up into the heavens. It is also notable to mention that from Bain al Qawsain between brackets, that from all the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Rasulullah witnessed in the heavens during Mi'raj, there is an incident that happened on the fourth heavens. And this is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks the Holy Prophet to ask the rest of the Anbiya, 124,000 of them minus one Rasulullah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands the Holy Prophet ask these previous prophets on what basis they were selected and ordained as Anbiya. Rasulullah asks them and within these collection of Anbiya there is Nabi Adam and Nabi Ibrahim and Nabi Nuh and Nabi Musa and Nabi, ha and, uh, Nabi uh, Isa, Yaqub and Yoshua, Yusuf alayhum as -salam. Rasulullah asks them O congregation of prophets, on what basis did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordain and select you as his selected prophets? And they all replied back with a single voice as per our traditions. They said, we were ordained with prophethood on the basis of our attestation, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah, Aliyu Waliyullah. Each and every one of the Anbiya attested to the wilayah of Amirul Mu'mineen. In any case, this divine place is the place where Rasulullah is recorded to have recited a Turak Asala on his way from Masjid al Haram to Masjid al Aqsa during this divine journey of Mi'raj and Isra. As we mentioned within the introduction, Masjid al Kufa is one of the most ancient mosques. Um, within human history. In fact, we have in narrations indicating that Masjid al-Kufa was the first mosque to be built on earth. Now, this does not negate the fact that Nabiullah Adam built the first house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in terms of the Quran. And this was also the first house of Allah in terms of the first place of worship. When we say that Masjid al-Kufa was the first mosque to be built, mosque yani in terms of its general meaning, masjid, a place in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is worshipped. For we have within our narrations that Masjid al-Kufa was the first mosque to be built. And the parameters of Masjid al-Kufa were laid down by Nabiullah Adam alayhi salam. We also have within our traditions that Nabi Adam salam, stood at this particular point over here. And it is from here that he sought forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the tark al awla, an act which goes against the recommended behavior of the holy prophets as opposed to performing a sin. And for this reason, Nabi Adam was then made to descend down from heaven onto earth. And as you know, within the story that he was separated from his wife, Lady Hawa. And it is at this point of Masjid al-Kufa that Nabiullah Adam supplicated to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, seeking for forgiveness. And it is at this point that the forgiveness, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgave Nabi Adam, accepted his supplications, and moving on from this point towards Jabal al-Rahmah is where Nabiullah Adam then met with Lady Hawa. It is recommended that a four rakat salat is prayed at this place and that we also seek for our forgiveness for the sins that we have committed in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. From the places of importance within the precincts of Masjid al-Kufa, we have the flood of Nabi Nuh. The incident of the flood of Nabi Nuh, which was one of the greatest historical events to have ever occurred within human history. The origin of this incident occurred from within the precincts of Masjid al-Kufa. Look at the story of Nabi Nuh in regards to how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the situation within the Quran. When we look into Surah to Nuh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala narrates the sentiments of Nabi Nuh. 
where he says, "Wa inni kullama da'autu hum li taqfir lahum ja'alu asabi'ahum fi adanihim wa stakshaw thiyabahum wa asarru wa stakbaru istikbaran." Nabi Allah nu says that, "O oh my Lord," and then I called out to them. And I preached them and invited them towards the right path, such that they may be forgiven for their sins. Nabi Allah Nu says, and the more I propagated the right message to them, the more I invited them towards truth, the more arrogant they became. They would put their fingers in their ears, such that they do not hear or listen to the words of Nabi Nu. Within our traditions, we have that the people were so violent in terms of their reaction to Nabi Nu, such that they would beat him until he would fall unconscious, bleeding from his nose and bleeding from his ears. And you find that Nabi Nu, salamu alaihi wasallam, lived for 2,500 years. He lived inviting people towards the path of Tawheed and towards the true worship of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, until there came a point. Where the people had reached a level where there was absolutely no salvation for them, and Nabi Allah Nu then does this du'a, which is narrated again in Surah An Nu. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa kala Nuhun Rabbi la tadar ala al-ardi min al-kafirin al-dayara inna ka intadar hum yudilu ibadka wa la yalidu illa fajran kafara. Nabiullah Nu says, "Ya Allah." He invoked upon them the divine punishment. He said, "Ya Allah, I invoke upon them through you a divine punishment, and do not leave any one of these kuffar. Because, Ya Allah, if you leave them and you allow them to live on this earth, they shall only continue to cause destruction and devastation and deviation." And even their future generations, the lineages from them, there will be none from amongst them who virtuousness or righteousness can be expected. For Ya Allah, send your divine punishment upon all of them. The narrations mention and history records for us that Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala punished the people of Nabi Nuh. Through the tufan, through the flood which engulfed and encompassed the entire known world of the time, and the historians mention for us from the hadith that this flood of Nabi Nuh, which then engulfed and encompassed the entire known world, the beginning of this flood occurred from Masjid Al Kufa, and you find that within the Sahan, within the courtyard of Masjid Al Kufa. Uh, right at the center, to be precise, there is a uh, there is a fountain that has been built, and this fountain is there to symbolize and mark the point from which the flood of Nabi Nuh began, and it is from here that the entire human population. Was destroyed by the adab of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala because of their insistence on kufr and disobedience after the truth was absolutely clear and manifest for them. Historians mention for us that from the people who boarded the Ark of Nabi Nuh, there were not more than 80 individuals. And this, my brothers and sisters, when we come to Masjid Al Kufa. And we look at the places of this history, and we take lessons, and we contemplate over the fate for the people that lived, the generations that lived behind us. You find that one lesson sticks out, dear brothers and sisters, that the people who stick to the right path, the people who adhere to the right path, from the time of human history, have always been from the minority, and therefore, even you and I. When we come to Masjid Al Kufa and we seek baraka from Masjid Al Kufa and we recount the uh, life of Nabi Nuh and uh, what happened to the people of Nabi Nuh, it should serve for us as a form of inspiration that we should never deter, we should never be demoralized for being on the right path, even if we are from the minority. For behind us, once again, we have the fountain that symbolizes the place which marked the beginning of the flood during the time of Nabi Nuh, which encompassed the entire known world at that time.
from amongst the places of reverence uh, within Masjid al-Kufa, we have the maqam of Nabiullah Ibrahim al-Khalil alayhi salam. Nabi Ibrahim, as you know, who is uh, described to be the father of monotheism in that the root of all monotheistic religions trace back to Nabi Ibrahim. We have within our historical narrations that Nabiullah Ibrahim al-Khalil had come to Masjid al-Kufa and had recited Salat within this great mosque that was built by his grandfather Nabiullah Adam and revered by every other Anbiya. The narrations mention for us that from within the A'mal of Masjid al-Kufa, it is important or it is recommended that we recite a four rakat Salat at this very place which historians record Nabiullah Ibrahim recited uh, his Salat. It is also important that as we visit the maqam of Nabiullah Ibrahim al-Khalil salawatullahi wa salamahu alayhi that we keep in mind and we recount the incidences that took place in his life. For indeed, one of the incidences that stand out from the life of Nabiullah Ibrahim is that when the dictator on the uh, tyrant, the Namrud of his time for propagating the message of Tawheed and the message of Risala decided to punish Nabi Ibrahim by throwing him into burning fire. There was an entire the narrations mention that a number of trees were chopped down and their box put together and a huge fire was lit. Uh, the smokes that were seemingly reaching up towards the sky, the fire that was so intense that Nabiullah Ibrahim had to be catapulted from a distance into this fire. So the historians mentioned for us that Nabiullah Ibrahim was punished for preaching the message of Tawheed by Namrud in this way. He was catapulted into this fire from a great distance. But then as the Quran tells us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the fire into a place that was cool and soothing, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded the fire to be a place of safety and a place of coolness. It was from the miracles of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that even though Namrud tried to execute and to kill Nabiullah Ibrahim in the worst of ways by burning him alive to death, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala changed the property of fire such that Nabi Ibrahim sat there in safety, in comfort and in coolness. In the tafsir of this verse, uh, we are told by the Ahlul Bayt uh, then that they were asked what dhikr, what dua did Nabiullah Ibrahim recite while he was catapulted into the fire? What supplication did he make to Allah such that the fire became a place of coolness and a place of comfort? The Imam tells us that Nabiullah Ibrahim began to recite Salawat ala Muhammadin wa ala Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. And it is by the barakat of this Salat and by him seeking intercession by Rasulullah, by Ali, by Fatima, by Hassan and by Hussein that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the fire into a place that was cool and a place that was of safety and refuge. From the places of uh, Ibadat where Salat, Turaqat Salat is also recommended is the Maqam of Abdul Saleh Al Khidr. This divine personality by the name of Khidr, who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed with a long life and such that his life serves as a proof of the possibility of an extended life for the awaited savior of mankind, Imam al hujjah Sahib al-Amri wa zaman From the history of Abdul Saleh al-Khidr, it is known that he, he is known for his allegiance towards Ahlul Bayt and the fact that he has been in the company of numerous prophets. One incident that stands out, and all these incidences in regards to Nabi al-Khidr are great and adheem in their sense, in their own respect. But one incident that stands out is at a time where uh, Abdul Saleh al-Khidr was together accompanying Nabiullah Musa alayhi salam, Musa Kalimullah. And they were seated by the banks of a river. And as they were seated and contemplating uh, the, over the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as you know, tadabbur and tafakkur, to contemplate over the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in itself ibadah, according to some narrations equivalent one hour 
of contemplation is equivalent to one year's worth of worship. And according to certain narrations, one hour worth of contemplation is better than 70 years of worship. In any case, Nabiullah Musa alayhi salam and Abdul Saleh al Khidr were seated together by the banks of a river. And as they were seated there, they were observing that a bird came down, flying from the sky, it came down, lifted some water with its beak, perhaps a drop or two of water in its beak, and then flew back into the skies. So as they observed this incident, Abdul Saleh al Khidr looks towards Nabi Musa and he says to him, Ya Musa, the ilm which is given to all the Anbiya and all the Awliya in comparison to the ilm that is given to Muhammad and Ali Muhammad is similar to that drop of water within the beak of that bird and the water in this river. Ya Ani, the ilm of Muhammad and Ali Muhammad is the river and that ilm of all the Anbiya and the Awsiya is equivalent to that drop of water within the beak of that animal in comparison to the ilm that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to Muhammad and Ali Muhammad. It is known that Nabiullah Khidr has been within the presence of Ahlul Bayt and within the presence of Rasulullah. For indeed the narrations mention that upon the martyrdom of Rasulullah when Amirul Mu'mineen had just completed giving the ghusl and the kafan to Rasulullah, a voice was heard from outside the door of Rasulullah, eulogizing the Holy Prophet in the most eloquent of manners, in the most grief, in, in a voice that was filled with grief. And over here, Amir al-Mu'mineen turned towards, he turned his attention towards this voice and he asked the people within the household if they recognized this voice. When they said, no, they don't recognize the voice, Amir al-Mu'mineen says that this is my brother Khidr, who has come to eulogize and pay tribute to the final messenger of Allah, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. It is very evident that the divinity of Masjid al-Kufa emanates from the fact that this was a revered mosque in which all the Anbiya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala came and prayed within this mosque, including Adam and Ibrahim, and the flood of Nabi Nu began from here. So just as the way Masjid al-Kufa was a strategic place of worship during the time of the Anbiya, you find that Masjid al-Kufa was also a strategic and an important mosque during the lifetimes of our A'imma, the divinely selected guides and representatives of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after Rasulullah. For historians mentioned for us that Amirul Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib salawatullahi wa salamahu alayhi upon having been granted the Zahiri Khilafah, the Zahiri leadership, he moved his capital city from, Mas from uh, Madina al-Munawwara to Kufa, to the city of Kufa. And from within the city of Kufa, he ruled in particularly from Masjid al-Kufa. And it is within this divine Masjid al-Kufa that Amir al-Mu'mineen had set up the judiciary and the court system actually functioned from within Masjid al-Kufa. And this in its place has witnessed numerous uh, historical uh, occurrences and divine Execu executions of divine justice at the hand of Amir al Mu'mineen. It was this Amir al Mu'mineen, through his divine knowledge granted to him by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that he was able to dispense justice amongst the people and deal with them freely, deal with them fairly, and to establish that government that symbolized freedom and justice and peace and tranquility to the extent that no other government in the history of humankind has ever seen. So you find that from within Masjid al-Kufa, there is an area within the Sahan marked as Dikkatu Tasht. And this is the area in which we're sitting. So this part of Masjid al-Kufa, from what we understand, encompassed the area of what would be seen today or known today as the High Court uh, within uh, any functioning government. Dikkatu Tasht in itself has a particular incident for which it is known. 
the historians mention for us that an unmarried lady was once brought by her brothers on the charge of adultery. The historians narrate that this lady had some sort of infection within her stomach, which made it to be extremely bloated to the extent that it seemed that she was pregnant. Now, the fact that she was unmarried, her brothers suspected her of adultery, and they therefore brought her into Masjid al-Kufa to ensure that capital punishment is implemented on her. Amir al this lady was brought to Amir al -Mu'mineen. Amir al asked this lady if she had been engaged in any relationship or she was involved in any relationship with any other man. And this woman very clearly objected and refused the allegation, saying that she had never been with any man and she didn't know the reason for this excessive bloating to the extent that her stomach had come out where she seemed to be pregnant. Amir al then asked for a cover and a particular tent to be brought and this woman was examined by the midwives and it was established that this woman had not been in any relationship with any other man and therefore it was clear that the charge of adultery was not applicable over here. What remains now is to figure out medically what was happening to this woman such that uh, her stomach had got bloated to such a great ex uh, to such an extreme state the historians mention for us that Amir al muminin asked for a particular type of water to be brought from the mountaintops of Sham and when this water was brought it was mixed and attached within a huge bowl and a tent was set up at this place and Amir al muminin asked this woman to sit in this uh, bowl of water, this huge bowl or this huge tray, this huge pool of water, he asked the woman to sit there and the historians then tell us because of the medical properties of this water that was obtained from the mountaintops in Sham, this water was able to dissolve into the woman and an easy passageway was then made for this infectious overgrowth within her stomach to come out of the body of the woman and her stomach went back to its normal level. And it is over here that this uh, incident happened within the watch and within the presence of the entire population population of Kufa and they praised Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they enchanted uh, his him in praise and they glorified Amir al muminin for having solved this medical issue and had it been somebody else in the place of Amir al muminin then they would have falsely accused this woman of adultery and would have taken her life away or would have punished her in a manner which is unjust. And this is from one of the fascinating points of uh, the dispension of justice by Amir al muminin such that the place in which this incident happened is marked till today, is known as Dikkat al-Tasht, and the people who come to perform the visitation of Masjid al-Kufa out of respect and out of reverence for Amir al muminin recite a Torah Qat Salat here. Within Masjid al-Kufa, we have an area marked which is known to be Dikkat al-Qadha. Dikkat al-Qadha is this place of Masjid al-Kufa where Amir al muminin had set up what would be known in today's terminology, the High Court. And the historians mention that Amir al muminin would sit at this particular spot in the, in the middle of the day and under the Arabian heat in the desert sun and while recording this program, we're here at about close to two o'clock in the afternoon and it's just about 40 degrees scorching and we are all dripped in sweat. And keeping this in mind, the historians tell us that Amir al muminin used to sit here every afternoon while he was not even under the shade. He would sit under the sun and he would be accessible to the people calling upon them and inviting them if they had any clarifications in regards to issues of halal and haram that they should come and ask him. He would recommend to them and he would encourage them that if they had any questions in regards to worshipping Allah, understanding Allah, that they should come and ask him. And it is from here that in addition to all this, Amir al-Mu'mineen salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi would dispense justice amongst the people. 
the trait of justice from a leader, from the head of a state, from the leader of a nation is a trait that you find very few people across human history have been able to exercise. And one of them that stands out by far after Rasulullah is Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib. It is over here that he would judge between those people who are right and those people who are wrong. And he would be able to identify the criminals and administer their punishments and be able to give uh, serve justice and ensure that there was peace and security within the entire Islamic region over which he ruled. From this Dikkatul Qadha, there are a number of incidences from the fantastic and the phenomenal ways in which Amir al-Mu'mineen dispensed justice amongst people. And from all the incidences that are there, there is one that I would like to share with you today, in that there were four traders residents of the city of Kufa. There were four of them traders who had gone together on a business venture. And it seems that from the narrations that they were partners, when the four of them traveled, one of them died on the way and three of these traders returned back to the city of Kufa. So the child of the trader that had passed away went to the other three partners and he said to them that my father had left with a certain amount of capital and a certain amount of wealth and if he died on the way, then uh, he asked them that he could get back all the capital and the wealth of their father, which is their rightful inheritance. Now at this point, the three partners collectively uh, told this young child of their business partner who was deceased on this travel away that your father didn't have any wealth, your father didn't travel with any capital, he didn't travel with any investment or with any sort of money. He died as he was without any wealth, we don't have any knowledge. All we did is that when he died, we buried him. The son asked, was my father sick? Was he killed? Did he fall sick? What happened? And they were reluctant to give an answer and they just said to him that he died uh, suddenly, it was a sudden death and we just buried him and we came back to Kufa as you see us. This son was very suspicious because he knew that his father had left behind or his father had traveled with a lot of wealth and a lot of money, hoping that he would be able to trade with it, invest in it and the money would multiply. So this young child went to Shuraih al-Qadi Shurai was one of the judges who used to administer justice and used to sit in the position of a judge even though he was not qualified. Shurai, they went forward to Shurai with the complaint, the child of the deceased. He said that this is what happened. Shurai asked the child, do you have any witness to your claim that these three, that your father left with a lot of wealth or with an X amount of money? He said, no, oh judge, I don't have any witness. He then looked at the three traders. He said, your partner who died, do you take an oath? Are you willing to take an oath that he didn't have any money with him? They said, yes, we are ready. So they brought the Quran, all three of them took an oath. So Shurai said, I judge or I rule in favor of these three traders because they took an oath by the Quran. The son was not satisfied with the decision given by the judge. So he went to the ultimate, the judge of all judges, the one who rules as per the divine judge, the one who rules as per the divine rulings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He went to that divine judge appointed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. None other than Mawlana Amir al muminin Ali ibn Abi Talib salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayh. The son goes to Amir al muminin he narrates to him the event that took place with Shurai and the death or under suspicious circumstances of his father and this missing wealth. Amir al-Mumin said, no problem, I will dispense the justice. So he called the entire people of Kufa and he asked for these three traders to be brought in. And it seems apparent that this incident takes place over here at Dikkatul Qadha. The three traders are brought in. Amir al-Mumin says, we have come to interrogate you to find out in regards to the death of your partner that you claim happened while you were on this business trip. And they said, yes, yeah, Amirul Mu'mineen, it is as if we told your, as if it is the same story that we said to Shurai and the same story that we said to the child that we say to you this, the, our business partner, the father of this child died suddenly while he was on the trip, we buried him and uh, we know of no wealth that he brought with him. Amirul Mu'mineen said, no problem. He gathered the people within the mosque. He then asked for these three people to be blindfolded. As they were blindfolded, three of them were separated and they were put in different places of the mosque. 
Amirul Mu'mineen sat at the Dikkatul Qadha and he asked for the first person to be brought in. And this is how Amirul Mu'mineen, the selected Imam and Khalifa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dispenses justice. He called the first person. He's blindfolded and he's been separated from the rest of his colleagues. Amirul Mu'mineen sat him down. He then told the people who were around him, when I make an indication to you, make sure you recite the takbir in your loudest voices. Why? We don't know. But uh, this is what Amirul Mu'mineen said to the people. Fine. Amirul Mu'mineen sat down the first person for interrogation. He has a blindfold. He's not able to see around him. He's not able to see how the people have surrounded him and what's going on. Amirul Mu'mineen asks him, or Amirul Mu'mineen makes the opening statement. He says to him, you think we don't know what has really happened? But indeed, we know what has really happened. We know what truly has happened. But in any case, we are going to interrogate you and know that your two colleagues have also divulged the truth to us. Now, this was a psychological strategy used by Amirul Mu'mineen. This person who was blindfolded, the first of three to be interrogated, panicked. And he said, Ya Amirul Mu'mineen, in all honesty, I really didn't want to kill this partner of ours, but my two colleagues forced me to kill him. Ya Subhanallah. So, Amirul Mu'mineen indicated towards the people and they recited a takbir, Allahu Akbar, in their loudest voices, all of them together. Now, the two other people who are uh, who were kept within the mosque for interrogation, when they heard the takbir, they began to panic and they didn't know what was happening. So Amirul Mu'mineen straight away knew that there is a case of murder over here and that the those who are responsible and guilty of this murder need to be punished accordingly. So they took the first uh, person who they interrogated for a statement, they took him to another part of the mosque. Then they brought the second person in. They brought the second person in. Amirul Mu'mineen sat down and he said to the people again, made an ishara, do a takbir when I tell you. They did so. And then he said to them, he asks the question to the second person. He says, listen, your first colleague has already divulged a number of secrets. The person was insistent. He said, yeah, Amirul Mu'mineen, I don't know what secrets you're talking about, but um, you may interrogate me. He says, so how did this person die, your colleague? He says, he died a sudden death. We don't know how he died. All we did is we buried him and we left. He said, how about his wealth? He said, he didn't have any wealth. So Amirul Mu'mineen interrogated him. He said, you claim that this person died suddenly. He said, yes. He said, tell me who gave the ghusl? Who gave the kafan? Where did you bury him? How did you bury him? Where did you get water for his uh, burial? And so on and so forth. When he started to ask all the details of the manner in which this person was buried, this person began to stutter and he gave a certain type of answer and he named certain people. Guess what? Amirul Mu'mineen asked for the takbir to recite it. All the people within Masjid Al-Kufa recited the takbir. He took the second person and kept him in the second part of the mosque. He called the last person. He told him, now your colleague claims that this person, your business partner died a sudden death and that you all gave him the ghusl and the kafa. He said, yes, that is true, Amirul Mu'mineen. Yani he decided to stick with his version of the story. Amirul Mu'mineen said to him, okay, if this is the case, tell me who gave the ghusl, who gave the kafan, where did you bury him and where did you get the water for the ghusl? This second per or this third person's answer differed from the second person's answer because their two stories conflicted and the first person out of fear already uh, confessed to the crime of killing. It is through this psychological strategy through this wisdom through this cleverness that Amirul Mu'mineen was able to discover that this man was actually killed unfairly by his business partners and they devoured his wealth Amirul Mu'mineen then called all three of them their blindfold was removed they were exposed for the lies that they said they confessed for the killing that they did. They went back and they brought the wealth that they usurped of their partner and the inheritance was given to its rightful owners, the child and the wife of this deceased person. And these people were charged for the murder that they 
committed. And you find it is incidences like these, cases that no other judge could have solved within history, or the manner in which this case was solved, you find that only a person such as Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Qaid al ghurr al-Muhajjaleen, the one who has inherited the ilm of the Anbiya from the beginning to the end, it is only a person with such a caliber who can give such a ruling and uncover the truth in the manner that Amir al-Mu'mineen did. Salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi. Now currently at the maqam of Jibra'il alayhi salam, the Archangel Jibra'il, who has been appointed and honored by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be that angel in charge of conveying the revelation to all of the Anbiya from Adam until Khatam. And it is narrated that Dabi Jibra'il visited this maqam uh, within this uh, Masjid al-Kufa a number of times. As we mentioned at the beginning of the program, that uh, the parameters of Masjid al-Kufa, the boundaries of Masjid al-Kufa was a place of worship for the angels even before the human population was created. On the other hand, we also mentioned in our uh, previous uh, recording that uh, Jibra'il had uh, passed by Masjid al-Kufa with Rasulullah on the night of Mi'raj al-Isra. Yani two incidences for which we know that, Nabi, uh, that Angel Jibra'il was here. And then there is another incident in the sense that, and this occurred in particularly to the maqam of Jibra'il alayhi salam, in that Amir al-Mu'mineen once was seated uh, within the masjid. As you know, Amir al-Mu'mineen took Kufa to be his capital. And it is from within Masjid al-Kufa that he delivered a number of his phenomenal and divine sermons which are now compiled in the form of Nahj al -Balaga. And it is from uh, within Masjid al-Kufa that these pure and divine munajat that Amir al-Mu'mineen used to recite emanated. It is from here that his exegesis of the Quran was delivered such that his commentary and tafsir just on Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Ibn Abbas says it was a sermon that started from the time of Maghrib and went on all the way until the time of Fajr, and yet Amir al Mu'minin had not completed the tafsir of Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. So this was the place of ilm and this place in which Amir al Mu'minin uh, guided the people towards the right path. It is narrated in particular to the maqam of uh, Archangel Jibra'il that once Amir al-Mu'mineen was seated here and as normal, he called out to the people and he said, Saluni kabla an tafqiduni. He said, ask me any question that you like before you lose me. Take advantage of this knowledge that has been bestowed to me from the first of the Anbiya to the last of the Anbiya. Seek this knowledge, take advantage of this knowledge to better your dunya, to better your akhirah. And it is narrated at this one time when Amir al-Mu'mineen made this call, you find that there were a lot of munafikin from amongst the people who were seated in Masjid al-Kufa. One person raised his hand and in a form of a mockery, they would ask him, how many, if you know, if you have ilm and you have knowledge of everything, then tell me how many white hairs are there on my beard, or how many white hairs are there on my head, and these types of silly, uh, questions, uh, they would ask these to mock Amir al-Mu'mineen and make fun of the fact that uh, he ha he claimed and he showed that he had al ghaib In any case, while this was happening, one person stood up from the crowd and his appearance was an appearance whereby his face was glowing and he was dressed in a manner which we would say in this day and age to be very smart and very presentable. And he stood up and he said, Ya Amirul Mu'mineen, can you tell me at this point where exactly Jibra'il is? Amirul Mu'mineen, it is said, looked up towards the heavens. He glanced with his blessed eyes towards the heaven. He looked towards the east and he looks towards the west. And then he pointed at this man with his blessed fingers and he said, do you ask me where Jibra'il is when you, the one who is asking me the question himself is Jibra'il? Subhanallah. This is one point from the very many times where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed Jibra'il to manifest himself in the form of a human being. Apart from the sanctity that surrounds Masjid al-Kufa due to the fact that 
it was a mazar, it was a place of visitation of the Anbiya, in that they would come here to recite Salat, in addition to the fact that it was a place of worship, uh, embraced by the Malaika and the angels before the creation of uh, the human race, in addition to all the rewards that are attached to reciting Salat in Masjid al-Kufa, the spirituality that emanates from this place, you find that Masjid al-Kufa was a center of education and a center of ilm and a center of excellence. You find that Imam Ja'far ibn Muhammad al-Sadiq salawatullahi wa salamahu alayhi played a central role in ensuring that Masjid al-Kufa became the focal and the central point of seeking and disseminating all sorts of Islamic and non-Islamic knowledges. Narrations tell us, as we stand over here by the maqam of Imam Jafar al-Sadiq, where it is recommended to recite a two rakat salat, it is important that we shed light on how Imam al-Sadiq transferred Masjid al-Kufa into a place of education and a center of excellence. Islam tells us as a religion that a great part of worship is seeking knowledge. We have a tradition from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam where he says, Talabul ilm faridatun ala kulli muslimin wa muslima. Seeking knowledge is a wajib, is an obligation upon every believing man and woman, mu'min, mu'minin wa mu'mina. Does not distinguish between male and female when it comes to gender and when it comes to the issue of seeking knowledge. So the historians tell us that within this Masjid al-Kufa, there were up to 4,000 scholars who would disseminate Islamic sciences from tafsir of Quran to uh, Arabic grammar, to hadith, to fiqh. And Sheikh Mufid mentions that he narrates that these 4,000 scholars, when they would disseminate their information and their knowledge, each and every one of them would say that we have heard from our master or we have heard from Imam Jafar ibn Muhammad as sadiq And you find that in addition to all these Islamic ilms, Islamic knowledges, including Arabic grammar, and you find that the Kufans, they formed a school and a version of uh, Arabic grammar that is highly revered till today. When you have two schools of uh, thoughts, competing schools of thoughts when it comes to Arabic grammar, you have the Basrans and you have the Kufans, you find that the Kufans emanated and built their stronghold from here. And the master of this science was Imam Jafar ibn Muhammad as sadiq salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi. Historians mention for us that in addition to Islamic sciences, it is also non-Islamic sciences that were taught from within Masjid al-Kufa under the auspiciousness of Imam al-Sadiq salawatullahi wa salamahu alayhi. For indeed, history has narrated that the great scholar by the name of Jabir ibn Hayyan, known today as Al-Gabr, the father of modern day chemistry, would teach and would learn in Masjid al-Kufa. He would teach from Masjid al-Kufa and he also learned in Masjid al-Kufa. A student of Imam Jafar ibn Muhammad al-Sadiq in Masjid al-Kufa. Therefore, brothers and sisters, when we come to this part of Masjid al-Kufa and we follow closely the traditions of Ahlul Bayt when it comes to seeking knowledge, we discover a fascinating secret. And this is that the foundation of the knowledge that then went on to propel civilization and modernization, that foundation of knowledge started from Masjid Kufa under the leadership of Imam Jafar ibn Muhammad as sadiq salawatullahi wa salamahu alayhi. Every place in Masjid al-Kufa is great. Every maqam is divine. But there is one place that stands out, and this is the mihrab of Amir al-Mu'mineen. The mihrab of Amir al-Mu'mineen, which you see is marked with a red light behind me, behind a shrine-like structure. The narrations mention that it is over here. Historians mention that it is over here that Amir al-Mu'mineen used to recite the Salat and it is from here that he used to lead the people in Salat al-Jama'ah. Until that fateful night of the 19th of Shahrul Ramadan, 
where Amir al Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib was struck mercilessly with a sword on his head by Abdul Rahman ibn Muljim la'natullah alayhi. The historians mention that on the 19th of Shahr Ramadan, Amir al Mu'mineen had his iftar at the house of Sayyidah Umm Kulthum. And after spending the entire night in a state of worship, in a state of salat, in a state of recitation of Quran, Amir al Mu'mineen left his house, which is not too far from Masjid al Kufa, and he came towards the mosque to lead the Salatul Fajr as would be his normal procedure. The narrations then mention that as Amir al Mu'mineen came into the mosque before the time of Salatul Fajr, he climbed up to the Ma'dana. The Ma'dana is the place where the Adhan is given. And Amir al Mu'mineen himself performed and recited the Adhan. And the historians mention that from amongst the particularities of the Adhan of Amir al Mu'mineen is that every time he ascended the Ma'dana to make the call of prayer, there was not a single household in Kufa except that the voice of Amir al Mu'mineen would reach their houses. So on this 19th morning of Shahr Ramadan, Amir al Mu'mineen, like regular, comes to the mosque to lead Masjid al Kufa to lead the Salatul Jama'ah for Fajr. He gives the Adhan. As he gives the Adhan, he walks towards the Mihrab and he begins to wake the people who are sleeping in this blessed mosque. And from amongst them is Abdul Rahman ibn Muljim, who was concealing a sword in, in, underneath his garments and he was sleeping on his belly. For Amir al Mu'mineen shakes him by the leg and he says to him, O oh man, if you must sleep, then sleep on your back or sleep on your right hand side or sleep on your left hand side. For indeed, this is the sleep of the prophets and the virtuous people and the pious people. And do not sleep on your belly. For indeed, this is the sleep of the shayateen. The narrations mention that as Amir al Mu'mineen began to lead the Salatul Jama'ah, and people were lined up behind him. It is here when the manifestation of the devil within Abdul Rahman ibn Muljim plotted to strike Amir al Mu'mineen. The narrations tell us that while Amir al Mu'mineen went into sajda, as he completed his sajda and was rising up from his sujood, ibn Muljim came running from behind the lines of Jama'ah, screaming out, Al Hukmu Lillah Laysa Lakaya Ali. And he struck Amir al Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib on his head. The narrations mentioned that Amir al Mu'mineen fell onto the prayer mat, blood flowing down his blessed head and his blessed beard. And it is at this time that Jibra'il descended down from the heavens and cried out, Tahaddamat Wallah Arkan al Huda. And it is at this point that Jibra'il cried out, Tahaddamat Wallah Arkan al Huda. Indeed, the foundations of this religion has been destroyed. It is in this blessed mihrab where Amir al Mu'mineen sallallahu alayhi was struck with a fatal blow from this La'een Abdul Rahman ibn Muljim. We come here and we pay tribute to the successor of Rasulullah, Amir al Mu'mineen, the divider of heaven and hell. And we recount the incident of his martyrdom. And you find over here that people from all over the world come to pledge their allegiance to Amir al Mu'mineen. They weep and they hold mourning ceremonies to commemorate the martyrdom of this Imam who was killed while he was oppressed. Much as Masjid al Kufa is a mosque that is revered for its spirituality and the mosque that is revered for being the foundation of the spreading of ilm that then propelled all different types of civilizations later on, you find that Masjid al Kufa is also a masjid, a mosque of grief and a mosque of tears. Not only was Amir al Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib, salawatullahi wa salamahu alayhi, brutally and mercilessly assassinated while in a state of prayer by Ibn Muljim al laeen But you also find that Masjid al-Kufa holds within it the mausoleum and the shrine. 
of the special emissary of Imam al Hussein Sayyid Shabab Ahlil Jannah by the name of Muslim bin Akil. For behind me, you see that there is the shrine and the burial place of Imam Muslim bin Akil. Muslim bin Akil was sent to the city of Kufa upon the death of the tyrant Muawiyah bin Abi Sufyan and the Khilafah being usurped by his son Yazid bin Muawiyah. The people of Kufa, according to historians, up to 17,000 of them had written letters inviting Imam al Hussein to the city of Kufa such that they may stand up in revolution under his leadership against the Bani Umayyah. And you find that Imam al Hussein then sent his special emissary and deputy, his representative, Muslim bin Akil, to come to the city of Kufa to evaluate and to analyze the sentiments on the ground and to see if they actually matched the sentiments that were uh, written through these numerous 17,000 letters that had reached to Imam al Hussein. Furthermore, we are able to understand from history that Muslim bin Akil had come to the city of Kufa in order to lay the foundations for a revolution that would then welcome Imam al Hussein and would be the right platform in order to restore the right of Imam Hussein and the right of Ahlul Bayt back to them, which was being usurped by Bani Umayyah. History has it that the Muslim nation those who claimed to be believers of the message of Tawheed, those who claimed to attest to the prophethood of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam are the same people who then were culprits, guilty of deceiving Muslim bin Akil, guilty of abandoning Muslim bin Akil, guilty of turning him in to the authorities after having invited and pledged allegiance to him to stand up against Bani Umayyah. The historians narrate that when Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad al lain was appointed as the governor of Yazid over the city of Kufa, there was a crackdown on the entire city and there was a curfew that was imposed and Muslim bin Akil was then a wanted man with a bounty on his head. The very people of Kufa at that time who had invited Muslim bin Akil and pledged allegiance to support him to restore back the rights of Ahlul Bayt were the same people who then abandoned him during this revolution such that the final day of his life he spent that eve as a stranger in the guest of the house of a lady known as Taua. In the following morning Muslim bin Akil was surrounded by the forces of Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad who were under the command of Muhammad ibn Ash'at. Historians have it that close to 500 to 600 armed soldiers and horsemen themselves had surrounded Muslim bin Akil, but he engaged them in war and he engaged them in battle in a form of self-defense. And he fought off a number of them such that Muhammad bin Ashad had to ask for reinforcement where Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad then expresses his astonishment and he says that I have sent 500 seasoned warrior battalions, horsemen to capture one person and you still ask for reinforcement? And at this point, Muhammad ibn Ashad points out to reality where he rebukes Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad and says to him that you have sent us to capture one of the most courageous, one of the battalions and one of the roaring lions from the family of Abu Talib and he's not like any other normal uh, grocer who we have come to arrest. The narrations mention that the enemies surrounded Muslim bin Akil because the houses were close to each other and the streets were very narrow. They even mounted on the rooftops and began throwing stones on Muslim bin Akil from every direction. They started lighting straw and hay on fire and throwing these fireballs on Muslim bin Akil. And from in front of him, the horsemen, together with their weapons, their swords and their spears, relentlessly attacked Muslim bin Akil. Despite being attacked from every direction, the people were not able to overcome Muslim bin Akil until they dug a hole, they dug a trench in the ground and they covered it with straw, luring Muslim bin Akil to come forward. And as he marched forward defending himself, he eventually fell into this trap 
and it is from here that he was arrested. The narrations mention that his entire body was filled with wounds and when they tied him, they took him to Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad to the Darul Imara. Darul Imara being the house or the high court or the residence, you may say, of the governor of Kufa. He was taken to the very top and after having been insulted, the command was issued by Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad to execute Muslim bin Akil. The historians mention that Muslim bin Akil was taken to the top of Darul Imara. It is over there that Muslim bin Akil then asked to recite a two rakat salat to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Having recited these two rak'ahs of prayer, he then turned towards the direction of Imam al Hussein. He turned towards the direction of his Mawla, of his Master, and he raised his hands towards dua and he said, O oh God, judge between those who have oppressed us. You be the judge between us and those who have oppressed us. Having said this, the historians mentioned that Muslim bin Akil was beheaded at the top of Darul Imara and his headless body was then thrown from the top of the Tarish down to the ground. More than that, having mutilated his body, they tied his decapitated body to a horse and his body was dragged across the streets of Kufa in order to serve as a lesson for anyone who supported Imam al Hussein. And hence, when we come here to Masjid al Kufa, we pay tribute to Imam Muslim bin Akil and the manner in which he was oppressed, the manner in which he was persecuted while he remained loyal and served the cause of the master of Jannah, Sayyid al-Shuhada Aba Abdullah al-Hussein. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. In addition to the shrine of Muslim bin Akil and Muqtar al thakafi within the precincts of Masjid al-Kufa, we have the shrine of Hani bin Urwa, this great companion and supporter of Amir al-Mu'mineen salawatullahi wa salamahu alayh. The narrations mention that historically speaking, when Muslim bin Akil came to Kufa, at one point of his revolution, which was nipped at the very early stages, you find that Muslim bin Akil was sheltered in the house of Hani ibn Urwa. When Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad through his slave, uh, through his spies network had found out that Muslim bin Akil was residing at the house of Hani ibn Urwa, Hani ibn Urwa was brought to Darul Imara for interrogation. And Hani ibn Urwa was a man where historians record was close to about 90 years of age. Despite his old age, you find that he still had the heat of the, the love, this heat which emanates from the love of Ahlul Bayt within him, that at the age of 90, he played a central role in the revolution of Muslim bin Akil, and he played rather a forefront role in the revolution of Muslim bin Akil. The historians mention that as soon as the spy agency and the network found out that Hani ibn Urwa was sheltering Muslim bin Akil, Hani was then brought to Darul Imara for interrogation. Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad asked Hani ibn Urwa about the whereabouts of Muslim bin Akil, who was by then a wanted man with a bounty on his head. At this point, Hani ibn Urwa refused to disseminate any information. The narrations mention that Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad began to hit Hani ibn Urwa, a 90-year-old man with a metal rod on his face repeatedly to the extent that he broke the nose of Hani ibn Urwa. He hit him on his forehead with this rod to the extent that he began to bleed excessively. He began to beat him on his face such that it is mentioned that the skin from his cheeks were hanging over his beard due to the intensity of his beatings. Hani took, Hani endured all this persecution, all this torture, 
in the name of Ahlul Bayt, in the name of protecting Ahlul Bayt, protecting Muslim bin Aqil, because to protect Muslim bin Aqil at that moment meant or translated into protecting Imam al Hussein. And it is in this manner that Hani bin Arwa was also beheaded, and together with the corpse of Muslim bin Aqil, his corpse was also tied to a horse and was dragged around the cities of Kufa. We come here to pay tribute to Hani bin Urwa and we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to inspire us to follow within the footsteps of Hani bin Urwa in that we may be an ounce of what Hani was when it comes to showing loyalty towards Ahlul Bayt. Wa akhirul da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.